All right, today's a big day. Uh, I'm excited. A couple weeks ago, I talked to you about this idea coming to the end of the year and just looking at your relationships. And I gave you a grid. I said, you want enjoyable and helps me grow. People who I enjoy being with and people who help me grow. And we got some people who I enjoy being with, but they don't help me grow normally on Friday night. Come on, somebody, right? And we got other people who help me grow, but doggone it, I don't like spending time with you. Okay, the sweet spot is for you to have people in your life that I love being with you, and whenever I'm with you, I'm growing. And I'm excited today because one of the people in that sweet spot for me is Dr. Chris Harper. And we went into 21 Days of Prayer, and 21 Days of Prayer is a big listening season for me, even though I, I, I have to talk a lot for my job. I want to put myself in a posture to hear and to receive. And so I asked my friend, Dr. Chris Harper, to come in and teach all of us today. He, you're going to love him as much as I do. He's going to help you understand and follow Jesus better. I'm super blessed that he's here. Why don't you welcome him to the stage, Dr. Chris Harper. Let's go. My wife texted me this morning from Texas. There's a massive cold front in Texas right now. It's 30 degrees. <laughs> she said, I'm, I'm struggling getting the kids ready and motivated for church. And I screenshotted what it was from my hotel this morning, negative 12. I just said, honey, I'm a real one. That's it. <laughs> sure, I'll pay for that when I get home. If you have your copy of God's Word, turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, we're going to be reading today verses 36 through 44. Matthew 24 verses 36 through 44. Verse 36, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, and one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Thus says the word of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, help us with your word today. Help us to understand it. Create in us a sense of unction and urgency, Lord. Deep knowledge that goes beyond our head, but into our hearts and our hands and our feet, God. Let it be your words that are heard today, Lord. May we decrease so that you can increase. And Father, may we not leave this church the same as when we came in. King Jesus, we pray that in your name and God's people said, Amen. So in the year A.D. 66, Judean rebels led by a man named Simon bar Gioria, they went to Rome to go to war. They went to, to war with Rome. And the Jews at the time had claimed that, that that battle was the final battle of Revelation. And after they were victorious, uh, Jesus would come. But shortly after the conflict began, Simon was, was captured by the Romans, taken back to Rome, and then he was beheaded. It was very anticlimactic. Needless to say, Jesus didn't come back. In the year 999, Sylvester II became Pope, and he predicted that Jesus would return um, at the millennium, the thousandth year mark. So on New Year's Eve, people rioted in the streets, uh, thousands of Christians flocked to Jerusalem, and it was very interesting. It was an interesting mass at midnight at St. Peter's Basilica that night. 
Well, when morning arrived and January 1 came, uh, the world had not ended. Instead of admitting he was wrong, the Pope doubled down and, and said, oh, the end times aren't triggered by the millennia. It's the millennia plus 33 years, signifying Jesus' death. So in the year 1033, Jesus would come back. Now, lucky for Sylvester, that was far enough into the future, he would be dead. Turns out he was wrong in life and death. Pope Innocent III told everyone that the apocalypse would occur 660 years after the founding of Islam in the year 1284. Guess what? He was wrong. In the year 1523, a, a group of astrologers in London predicted that Jesus would return on February 1 of the following year by way of a gigantic flood. The, the planets were going to align in the constellation of Pisces, the fish. So the conclusion was inevitable. The entire world would be swallowed up by the sea. The prophecy had many in London worried. So on February 1, they all ran to high ground. Um, there was no flood, and reportedly, it didn't even rain. In 1806, Mary Bateman put the world on notice when her hen began laying eggs that were carved with the word, Christ is coming. It was the first Chick-fil-A. <laughs> People from all over the world came to see her Christian chicken. But alas, it was only a scheme. Mary had taken the previously laid eggs, had carved them with acid, and then reinserted them back into the chicken. This story has no winners, but the chicken got the worst of it. Herbert Armstrong was one of America's first televangelists. He founded the Worldwide Church of God in 1933, and then he predicted that Jesus would come back in 1936. Uh, Jesus didn't. Um, that misprediction didn't shake his confidence, though. Um, he rescheduled the apocalypse for 1943, missed it, um, went back, said it again. It would happen in 1972. He missed it and thought he would die. He said, well, let's just go for 1975. Unfortunately, he lived <laughs> to see that it didn't happen in 1975. The real miracle is that anybody was still listening to him. And let's not forget my guy, Pat Robertson. In 1976, Pat predicted that the world would end sometime uh, in 1972. He was wrong. That hasn't stopped him from trying again. In his book, The New Millennium, uh, he said the world would end on April 29th, 2007. Um, just, we'll just say, God bless you, Pat. <clears throat> Church, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 36. Concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And then verse 42, therefore stay awake. For you do not know on what day the Lord is coming. Brothers and sisters, I don't know what day the Lord is coming. Pastor Tim doesn't know what day the Lord is coming. Your crazy Aunt Martha doesn't know. We don't know. You know, it's interesting, the um, state of California is basically on a fault line. It's on an earthquake fault line. So for decades, they would try to predict earthquakes in California. And they would always miss the prediction. So thousands of lives would be lost, billions of dollars in infrastructure would be ruined. So finally, some guy in the California government raised his hand and said, listen, our state's on a fault line. The earthquake is inevitable. What if we stopped trying to predict it and started preparing for it? 
So they started building buildings that were earthquake proof. Schools that were earthquake proof. They started doing drills that people would, would prepare for when the earthquake happened. And since countless lives have been saved and billions of dollars have not been lost. They moved from a people of prediction to preparation. Listen to me. As Christians, we are not called to be a people of prediction. We are called to be a people of preparation. The return of Jesus is inevitable. He is coming back. And we're not called to predict His return. We are called to prepare for His return. And, and fam, this has been heavy on me. I've come into 2024 realizing that I didn't, I didn't do well in 2023 preparing for my king's return. And I've been asking myself the last few weeks, man, how am I preparing for King Jesus' return? Right now, how are we preparing for the return of the king? Because Scripture is clear. He is coming, and He's coming like a thief in the night. There's no early warning system. No sirens. No text reminder. You don't get to schedule an appointment with Him. He's gone one minute, and then He'll be back the next. That means we must be ready. Jesus says in verse 44 of our text, Be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. You don't know. You won't expect it. So you've got to be ready. Allow me to share a little wisdom from a modern day philosopher, uh, Conor McGregor. They put a mic in his face, which he loves, and they asked him, they said, how do you prepare for a fight? And Connor responded, when you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Hmm. Come on, Connor. When you stay ready, we don't have to get ready. You and I, we've got to stay ready. This morning, I want to give you three things that the Lord has impressed upon me that I'm going to impress upon you that helps us stay ready. If you're ready, say, we ready. ready. No, y'all ain't ready. If you're ready, say, we ready. ready. First, we stay ready by knowing King Jesus. More and more. Fam, I want to know Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Do you know Him? I mean, do you know Him like you should? Do you know His story? Do you know His Father? Do you know His friends? I want to know His story better. I want to know the Jesus of this book. I want to know the men and women in this book. I want to give my thoughts and my time and my energy to knowing Him. When I get to heaven, I don't want to be surprised. I don't want to get to heaven and look like I don't belong. When I get there, I want to know the people. I want to know the stories. When Jesus starts to tell a story, I want to hit the guy next to me and say, bro, listen to this. This is where he turns the water into wine. Jesus, you wild. (laughs) Tell it again, Jesus. I want to know the stories. I want to know the players. I want to quote my heroes. When Esther walks into the room, I'm going to shout, Girl, if I perish, I perish. (laughs) Unreal. 
I want to walk up to Joshua and say, as for me and my house, I've got that tatted on my arm. I want to look at Habakkuk and say, bro, you started soft, but you ended strong. How embarrassed are you going to be when you meet Habakkuk and he says, what would you think about my book? You say, book? What book? When you meet Zephaniah, when you meet Obadiah, how embarrassed will we be? Listen, brothers and sisters, there are not a lot of strangers in heaven. You tracking? People who make it to heaven are people acquainted with heaven on earth. You can't know Jesus, you can't know God if you don't know His Word. If you don't know the Bible. Think about this. Most professing Christians, professing Christians, pick up and read their Bible less than one time per month. Think about that. There's almost 700 hours in a month. And you read your Bible less than 30 minutes a month. And you think you know God. No. I mean, you know the score of last night's game. You know how cold it was this morning. You know when the next season of Yellowstone drops. But you don't know God. His son. His spirit, you can't, not unless you're willing to invest time in this. You got to put in the time. We prepare for Jesus coming back by, by knowing his word. There's something that I've practiced for years. I call it Bible schizophrenia. I coined that. It's not super popular. But every time I read the Word of God, I'm reading it as one of three people. This is what helps me know Scripture. Every time I open up this Word, every day I'm reading this Word first as a son. My dad wrote me a letter. My father wrote me a letter. Your father wrote you a letter that has promises and it has principles and it has sin and danger to avoid and you need to read that letter he wrote it for you and to you you need to read it and I'm not talking about listening to podcasts I'm not talking about listening to other preachers read it I'm talking about you reading it imagine if your lover wrote you a love letter every day and then you ended up falling in love with the mailman and he ain't even cute. That's how some of y'all are. No, no, no. I want to read the letter. My father wrote me a letter. Your father wrote you a letter. So we read it as sons and daughters. Secondly, I read the word as a brother or a sister. I read the word in community with others. Iron truly does sharpen iron. There are things that you see in the word that I might miss. And there are things that I see in the word that you might miss. And when we're reading in community, we grow in the word. So I've got a group of people that I read the word with, that I can text the word to. Tell me what you think about this. What did God mean here? What should we say to this? Because I'm in community with other brothers and other sisters digesting His Word. So I read it as a son and I read it as a brother. And lastly, I read it as a father or you read it as a mother. Every day I read this Word and I'm looking to deposit one thing that I can pass on to someone else. One truth. One Scripture. 
One word that I want to deposit so that when my children come to me, when my wife comes to me, when my neighbor comes to me, when my co-workers come to me and they need truth or they need guidance or they need advice and I reach down into my account, it doesn't say insufficient funds. There's something there that I can pull out and give away. Some of you, in the next two hours, in the next two days, someone's going to come to you and they're going to need to hear from God. They're going to need a truth. They're going to need a word. And you're going to try to make a withdrawal and it's going to come up insufficient fun. No. I read it as a son, as a brother. I'm reading as a father because I want to I wanna pass it on to someone else. Brothers and sisters, if we want to stay ready, we've got to know God's Word. I love what Dr. Howard Hendricks said. A Bible falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. Hmm. Second, We stay ready by helping others know King Jesus. Matthew 7, 14, For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. I want to say that again. The gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. I think as Christians, we get excited, rightly so, We get excited when we find the narrow gate. We want to go in and we want to be with our king. But but some of us, some of us, we need to stay back and shout, it's over here. I found it. The gate is over here. Hey, listen, that path is broad. It leads to destruction and death. But over here's the narrow gate. I found it. Come look. Come see. It's over here. We get so caught up in our Christian huddles. And we get so caught up in our Christian bubbles. We wake up and we we do our Bible study. And we go to our Christian gym. And go to our Christian school. And we eat a lot of Chick-fil-A. And we forget that there's a dying world. People in want of hope. People in want of meaning. I love what Tim Keller said. The world doesn't need more content. The world needs meaning. And purpose. And it's found right there at that narrow gate. And we stand there with the trumpet and we stand there with the flag and we say it's over here. We have got to get into the habit of telling people about King Jesus. And not just, not just wanting them to know Jesus, but after that, I love that Pastor Tim and your church, you're focusing on mentorship. You're focusing on discipleship. An acquaintance of mine recently said that the loneliest he's ever been was coming to know Christ. He said, everybody wanted, to, everybody wanted me to follow Jesus, but nobody wanted to walk with me afterwards. Hmm. Shouldn't be like that. No, we disciple people to Jesus and we disciple people in Jesus and we disciple people through Jesus. Making disciples who make disciples. So in 2024, a time when everyone has something to say but no one is really saying anything, how do we do that? Do we put, do we put up billboards? I don't know. Do we stand on street corners with signs and and megaphones? I'm not sure how effective that is. Do we take to the winsome streets of Facebook and Twitter? 
Probably not. Here's what I think. I think the new evangelism is hospitality. It's Christian hospitality. Listen, our homes are not kingdoms that we build for our comfort. Our homes are places that we can invite people to that have yet to embrace King Jesus. A place where people can express their doubts and fears and ask questions in a place that is warm and winsome as we share the gospel. I'm convinced over the next hundred years, it won't be churches that are winning people to Christ. People will be won to Christ around the dinner table. Breaking bread, fellowship, in coffee shops, in homes. You're inviting people to come and drink and taste of Jesus as you show them Christian hospitality. Christian hospitality. Our homes are outposts of God's kingdom. They are places and spaces where we get to serve and love others for the glory of God. Listen, in the world today, in the political climate we're in, in all the noise, I'm telling you, kindness will be king. Kindness. And I teach my children from a very young age, Always mean what you say and say what you mean, but don't you ever be mean when you say it. Always say what you mean. It's okay to have conviction. It's okay to be bold. Say what you mean. And when you say it, have enough integrity to mean what you say. But don't you ever be mean when you say it. We don't have to divorce compassion from conviction Jesus was a lion and a lamb we don't have to divorce those things it will be kindness and hospitality that will bring people into the kingdom of God and that's nothing new it's always been like that you don't believe me read the gospel The only people Jesus was unkind to were the religious folks. Read the Gospels. We stay ready by knowing Him. We stay ready by pointing others to Him. And lastly, we stay ready as we make the most of King Jesus. People who stay ready want to make the most of King Jesus. Jeremiah 29, verse 7. Every Christian should memorize this verse. Jeremiah 29, verse 7. But seek the welfare of the city, the one I've sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. Why? For in its welfare, what? You will find welfare. Pray and work and live for the welfare of your city. To seek the welfare of your city means that we reorient our lives around the idea that it is Jesus above everything. And we have this bent towards others, this otherly life. Brothers and sisters, we should remember that we are aliens and strangers and sojourners in a foreign land. And we don't talk like that anymore. Maybe we need to bring some of that language back. Foreigners, aliens, we should be a little weird. CNN was recently interviewing Dr. Russell Moore, and they said, Russell Moore, don't you think it's weird that you still hold to a traditional view of marriage? Don't you think it's archaic that you hold to a traditional view of marriage? Don't you think it's weird? And Russell Moore looked at her and said, oh, honey, we believe in stuff a lot weirder than that. It gets real weird. 
We think of previously dead guys coming back on a horse to take us home. We should be a little weird. We, we are not Americans first and foremost. We are Christians who happen to live in America. It is not Western principles or Western ideas that govern our lives. It is God, His Word, and His Spirit that governs our lives. You are not a Republican first and foremost. You are a Christian who happens to be a Republican. You are not a Democrat first and foremost. You are a Democrat who, you are a Christian who happens to be a Democrat. Jesus didn't come to take sides. Jesus came to take over. To take over. Before your children were your children. They're God's children. Before your wife is your wife or your husband is your husband. It's God's son and God's daughter. Before that man was your neighbor, your co-worker, your employee. He was your brother. Made in the Imago day, Worthy of love. And honor. And dignity. And respect. As Christians, we are to consider their needs, their wants, is more important than our own, Philippians 2, 3. We are to seek the welfare of the city. Now the Hebrew word here for welfare means prosperity. That means the, the city we inhabit, it should be prosperous, because of what we bring to it. The city should flourish and grow because of what our hands do physically. The labor of our hands. So we plant, and we sow, and we reap, and we build, and we design, and we teach, and we instruct, and we turn wrenches. We prosper the city. The city that we inhabit should be prosperous because of what we bring to it intellectually. Our intellect, our imagination, our creativity. Listen, God is the creator of everything and you and I were made in His image. We should be the most creative people on the planet. Music, art, theater, dance. We should be leading the way. The city we inhabit, it prospers because of what we bring to it emotionally. Our disposition and our attitudes, we are called to be a joyful people. Even in the midst of adversity. Even in the midst of trial. Even in the midst of loss. We can say with the Puritans, I love it when God throws me into the cellar of affliction because it is there that He keeps His best wine. And we drink deeply. We are a people of unity, not division. We are a people of peace. Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the peacemakers. That's not a great translation. The original Greek says, blessed are the peace creators. Where we go, we create peace. And sometimes that peace is exercised through mercy and grace and forgiveness. Sometimes that peace is brought about by the hard hammer of God's law. But we're wise and we discern and we bring peace to where there's unrest. Brothers and sisters, the world we inhabit is broken. I get it. Creation yearns out for God's return. I get it. But the world should be a better place because you and I are in it. The world should be a better place because Graceway is in it. Kansas City should be prospering because of you. What would happen? What would happen if you brought good and light 
and prosperity to the city that you inhabited. I'll tell you what it would happen. We'd change the world. The Bible is clear. The people will look at you and they will look at your good works and they will look at your good deeds. And what? They will give glory to the Father. Not to me. Not to you. Not to a building. But they will see the goodness you bring and they will glorify God. They will see how you love one another. Acts chapter 2. A watching world watched the church serve and love one another. And the Bible says that they added to their numbers daily. Why would I want to follow King Jesus if his professing people hate one another? Fight with one another. Call each other names. Don't love one another. Friends, some of your neighbors would be shocked to know that you're a Christian by the way you treat them. Matter of fact, statistics tell us most of you in this room don't even know your neighbors. Yet we are made in the image of a triune God. God's the original small group. He's the OG. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit has always existed in community. And you were created in His image. You were made for community. You are most like God when you're living in community. Some of your co-workers would be shocked to know that you follow Christ because of the way you talk to them. Some of your employers, they can't even fathom that you're a religious person because of the way you gossip, because of your laziness, because you don't want to give your best unless it's best for you. No, not the people of God. I don't care if it's Babylon, Dallas, or Kansas City. We are to seek the welfare of the city. The prosperity of the city. We are to do good and be good and live in such a way that people would glorify our good God. And there are too many in the Western church today that are what I call heaven gazers. Like the church at Thessalonica. Somebody there at Thessalonica said, well, Jesus is coming back any day now. So they just stopped working. They stopped living. They stopped doing good. They stopped sowing and stopped planting and stopped reaping. So Paul had to write them a letter and say, hey, listen, you've got to get back to work. No man knows the day. No man knows the hour. You've got to keep working. You've got to bring good to your city. You've got to sow and reap and plant so that when when people see your good works, when they see you prospering the city, they'll give glory to God. Brothers and sisters, it's okay to be heavenly minded. It's okay to fix our mind on heavenly things, but our feet have to be firmly planted on this ground. we got to keep working. We got to keep serving. We got to keep knowing Him more and more and more. We've got to point more and more people to Him. Why? Because He's coming back and we don't know when. It's when we least expect it. Wouldn't it be amazing for King Jesus to come back while you're reading about Him in His Word? Wouldn't that be amazing? I've got a friend, 80 years old. He pastored for 50 years. Two weeks ago, he went to be with the Lord. I asked, I asked how did it happen? They said, well, he did the same thing he's done for 50 years. He got up in the morning and he got in the word with God and then he kissed his wife and he poured a bowl of Fruit Loops. I can't think of a better way to go out. I want to be with God. I want to kiss my wife. My buddy said he kissed his wife. She turned to do something with the dishes. He took a bite and his heart stopped. Praise be to God. Are you kidding me? The book of Romans and Fruit Loops take me now. What an amazing way to go. 
Could you imagine? Could you imagine sharing Christ with someone? Sitting at a table and telling someone about the goodness of God and then all of a sudden you hear the trumpet? Wouldn't that be amazing? Pass the potatoes. Get ready. Wouldn't it be phenomenal that if we're out working in the city, loving the least of these, Serving the marginalized. Being a voice for the voiceless. Serving our employer well. Loving our neighbors well. Prospering the city. And then as we're doing that, Jesus comes by and He puts His hand on your shoulder and He says, that's enough. Enter into the joy of your Master. Well done, good and faithful servant. Oh, I can't wait for that day. I hope when he comes back, I've got a plow in my hand, not a remote. Oh, let him come back. Let him catch me learning about him. Let him catch me telling somebody about him. Let him catch me doing good in my city so that they may glorify His name. Listen to me. When you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. So we know Him. We tell others about Him. And we seek the good of our city. Father God, we give You thanks for this day. Thank You for Your Word, God. God, I confess that I didn't do a good job preparing for you coming back in 2023, God, but it's not going to be like that in 2024. God, I'm going to be a man of preparation. God, I'm going to stay ready so I ain't got to get ready. I pray that for my brothers and sisters in this room, God. I pray that for this church. That when you come back, you look at grace way and you'd say that's enough well done good and faithful servant Jesus I wouldn't be upset if that day was today come on back I'm ready I can't wait to see you not as if I'm looking through a glass but face to face see you for who you are and you to see me for who I am until that day, Jesus, we'll keep watching, we'll keep sharing, we'll keep working in your holy and precious name. Amen.